Good morning, friends. Thank you for joining me this Friday. I hope that you've had a great week. It's been a warm one, isn't it? And today doesn't look like it's any less warm. I was thinking about mowing a lot of grass today, but with this heat, I might save it for a few days. Just maybe. The grass can wait, right? But uh, today we get to look at Psalm 56 together. And Psalm 56 is kind of a crazy psalm. It's crazy because it comes from a very crazy time in David's life. David, the man who wrote the psalm, the man who would be king, at this point he was running away from Saul. It was the first time he really had to escape from Saul. And in his panic, he makes this crazy decision that the safest place to go to get away from Saul is to run to Gath. Now, Gath might be a slightly familiar name for you, but for a funny reason. When we hear the word Gath, if you know anything about the story of David's life, you would recognize that Goliath was called Goliath of Gath. Why? Because he was from Gath. So, Goliath, the great warrior of the Philistine army, came from this city called Gath, and David, when he's running away from Saul, runs there to the city where he killed their big leader, Goliath. I don't know why. I honestly don't. I mean, maybe he thought, well, the enemy of my, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, he forgot that he was their enemy too. So it really didn't work out well for him because he gets there to this city. He's thinking I can hide out here. Maybe, maybe I can, I don't know, find employment. Who knows what he was thinking? And right away, some of the guys there grab him and they're like, "Hey, this is the guy that killed Goliath. Let's take him to the king. The king will give us money for him." So David at this moment finds himself in really hot water. And he does something that just seems insane. He acts insane. He starts acting like a madman. He sings, he dances, he dribbles, uh, saliva down his face. He makes marking on the doorpost with something, maybe the saliva, maybe something else. He just acts insane. And the king of Gath looks at him and he says, this guy's crazy. Why are you bothering me with him? He's not coming in my house. And so David escapes. Now out of this moment of sheer terror, David writes two different psalms, two different uh, reflections on what God did for him in the midst of his fear. And this is one of those great things. You know, as David went on and ran away from Saul many more times and had quite the history before he ever became king, you get this sense that this moment where he went right into the valley of the shadow of death like never before, and God brings him out. This was striking for him. It was character shaping. Think about those times in your life where God has brought you out of the very worst uh, situations that you've possibly been in. I can think of a few where he has spared me and uh, uh, one or two where I think, wow, he really must have had something planned for my life because I'm still alive. Now, that sort of thing does give one a certain sense of confidence, a certain sense of you know, I have a purpose in my life. And I think that David walked with that. A sense that if God had brought him out of Gath, God had a reason for everything he was doing with him. So now let's turn to the psalm and see what David has to say here. So Psalm 56. Join me if you will. You can read along on your own or uh, listen as I read. For the director of music to the tune of A Dove on Distant Oaks of David when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. Be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. My slanders pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. When I am afraid, I will trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? All day long they twist my words, they are always plotting to harm me. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, eager to take my life. On no account let them escape in your anger, O God, bring down the nations. Record my lament, list my tears on your scroll, are they not in your record? When my enemies will be turned back, then I will call for help. But I, this I will know, that God is for me. In God, whose words I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, O God. I will present my thank offerings to you. 
for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Now, in this psalm, David talks about, it's kind of confusing for me, quite frankly, because he talks about slanders, he talks about men that's attacking him, and we don't know at that point if he's referring to those men that were chasing him out of Saul's uh, palace, out of Saul's rulership into Israel, if he's talking about these men that have grabbed him, which is more likely, Whew, sorry, bright light makes me yawn, and there's I'm using a bright light, so uh, so yeah. Anyways, so the uh, the men that had grabbed him and taken him to the king in Gath, he might be talking about them as well. But he says that in the midst of this, in the midst of the attacks that are happening, I will trust in the Lord. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortal men do to me? In the end, he recognizes two things that I want to talk about because they're just beautiful. The first is this idea that you record my lament in verse 8. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? And this is the idea that he, uh, that he believes that God is keeping personal track of his agonies, of his woes, of his hurts. He says, look, I'm being mistreated, God. Record my tears. Be the one who will do justice for me. Be the one who will protect me and the one who will get revenge on my enemy. In order for God to do that, God would have to know what David had gone through. And so David seizes on that and he says, Lord, you see my tears. And I love that idea that the Lord records our tears. Isn't that nice? Even if you're crying alone, your tears are being recorded. Even if you are hidden in your sorrow, weeping. The Lord knows your sorrows and tracks them, not just monitors them, but records them. There's this beauty to this imagery here. And then he turns on and he says one other thing that's beautiful. He says, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Sorry. What can man do to me? And that's the... Uh, the that and he says it in one other place as well he says what can mortal man do to me um it uh, and then he goes uh, so the what am i saying here sorry i'm saying that what david is telling us is what paul will say to us again in romans eight thirty eight. he's saying that if god is for us then who can be against us now, frequently, the fear of man is a, probably the greatest problem for every Christian out there. The idea that uh, we need to do what pleases men, or we need to be fearful of men in power over us, or the wicked among men. But David, very contrary to that, says what Paul says, and what Scripture tells us, and what the Holy Spirit tells us, that if God is for us, who can be against us? No one can be against us. That means that God is in complete and utter control. So what have we gathered from this today? We've gathered a real sense that uh, God is near to David and God is near to us, that we can trust God. And because we can trust God, we can do two things. We can trust God to record our tears, to know our sorrows, to know where we're coming from. So that means that he understands us. That means as well that he has a justice planned that includes those who have hurt us and wounded us. And secondly, we can trust God. And if God is for us, then who can be against us? So trusting him means not having to live in fear of man. But instead it means to live in fear of God, taking refuge in him and walking with him. Now for us, all of this points to Jesus, who is the one who is for us, who is our, uh, the one who intercedes on our behalf to the Father. As we turn to him, trusting and delighting in his love, he is our shield, he is our protector, and he is the one who ultimately we look to for revenge on the wicked and for justice and forgiveness for ourselves. So, as we look to the Lord's anointed, let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise your name for David and for the life that he lived, for the chaotic and crazy times in his life where things just seemed like 
they went bad and he went from being a hero in a nation to be on the run uh, an enemy of every citizen through no fault of his own we thank you father that you were with him in that time and because he recorded his sorrows and his thoughts and his prayers we can take comfort in seeing how you worked in his life as we look at our own lives and at the chaos that's around us and the chaos of disease the chaos of rulers that may or may not be competent the uh, the threats that we face in the world around us and we can say with confidence that if God is for us nothing can stand in our path more to the point nothing can stand in the path that he has for us for drawing near to him please whet our appetites for you today that whatever we go and whatever wherever wherever we go and whatever we do that we would draw ever closer to you, walking with you in prayer and as David did, recording our thoughts, our tears, and our delights and our thanksgiving as we take refuge under you. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining me this morning. I hope that you have a blessed and a beautiful day. Bye-bye.